everyone out there in Instagram and Facebook land. Um, hope you had a great Easter. It was, we were pretty blessed with some stunning autumn weather. Um, nice for a change to get out of the heat and rain. We've got some sun outside. Unfortunately, we can't make use of it as we normally would with these social distancing and self-isolation restrictions. But uh, I'm Chris Sixon from Dial Australia, and we're going to do some angler talk with you. Just a little incentive from Dial Australia at the moment to keep the guys that can't go fishing entertained uh, and give you something to look forward to every couple of days, hopefully. Um, Peter Phelps and Jacka Davis have already done their little turn. Um, great jobs, super informative, and I hope I can... Uh, keep up the same standard so they've asked us to have a chat about brim fishing uh brim tournament fishing mainly i guess and we've had heaps and heaps of questions come through i think 40 odd on each instagram and facebook um unfortunately same of the other guys i won't be able to answer all of them because i haven't got all day uh, but i'll pick a handful out or i've picked a handful out um and hopefully give you the uh the best i can of what i've got there so um, as a starter, I've been brim fishing pretty much my whole life. I've started when I was really young with my pop bait fishing, um, and then I've been tournament fishing for about 16 or 17 years now. Um, so hopefully that gives me some cred to be talking to you about this. I never profess to be an expert in any of it, um, but have done it for a long time and have seen quite a lot of things and got a lot of experience in it. So I'll give you my best version of um, some answers to it all. So. The first one is, what do you find easier to target, black or yellowfin brim? Uh, that one's pretty easy for me, 100% yellowfin. Um, that was what I did growing up. That was what I did for the first major por portion of my tournament fishing career as well. Um, and I just find them a lot easier to get in the same headspace as the fish and, and be able to target those fish effectively. Um, the differences I find between yellowfin and black brim. The yellowfin, I, I find them a lot more aggressive. They they like to chase a lure down. They're really inquisitive. They like to tap, play with, hit a lure. Um, they'll come from a long distance to grab it. And they're less likely to shut down from what I've seen than, um, than the black brim do. They're, they're a lot more reactive to movement and to things in their face. Uh, whereas a black brim can really lay dormant possibly due to the cooler climate they live in a lot of the, a lot of the time, um, or whether it's just the genetic makeup of those fish, I'm not sure, but they seem to be a bit fussier at certain times. If you can find those fish quite often, uh, the black brim, and you can't catch them, or well, I can't catch them anyway. Um, whereas with the yellowfin, unless it's super clear and they can see you, if you know they're there, there's every chance that they're at least going to show some interest to the lure. Uh, I've had many circumstances, especially Gippsland Lakes uh, and places like that where the water's fairly clear with the black brim. See hundreds, thousands of them. Cast at them, cannot get them to eat. Uh, if that's the situation with yellowfin, then there's normally some sort of trigger, a bit of wind, a bit of dirtier water, a change in depth, um, or the right lure, that'll pique their interest. So for me, that's 100% uh, that's yellowfin brim. Uh, way easier to catch. Um, next one is what are your top tips for bagging larger fish? That one's really hard because I don't, personally don't target large fish too often. Um, quite a lot of the guys in the tournament scene are really well known for catching many big fish. Um, if I come across one, so be it, I'm happy. Uh, personally, more down the line of trying to be consistent and catch decent quality fish uh, more than those really big ones. The, the way you target those fish be it the quality ones or the bigger ones, you just have to fish the best stuff with the right gear. Um, by that I mean fish the structure that those bigger fish are likely to be holding on. So they're the key points, a key point of current, lots of current, um, lots of bait and lots of shoulder. And if you can combine all those together at the right time, uh, there's a fair chance that the bigger fish is going to be in that area. The hardest bit for me uh, is weeding through a lot of smaller fish to do that sometimes. So after 16, 17 years of tournament fishing up and down the coast, uh, and all over Australia in fact, you get to know where those big fish are more likely to sit. Um, if you catch one in an area, you catch a big fish in a certain spot, especially when it comes to yellowfin uh, and structure orientated fisheries, there's every chance that there's gonna be another big fish in that same area at another time. 
Um, I always find those big fish are there for a reason. If there's the right situation, they will be back. You can pull one out of a, say there's a post uh, in the right bit of current, plenty of bait around it all the time, good depth, good cover. You pull a big fish off that, every chance another big one's gonna, even if there's a small one comes in, a big one's gonna come in, take that spot, and he'll hold up in there. So that goes for a lot of different structure types, boats, moorings, um, oyster racks, the whole kit. Uh, when it comes to more open water, weed beds, um, deep water fishing, open water fishing for those fish, it's more down the lines of finding the thing that those big fish want to eat more than targeting the area those big fish are going to be. So that's where I find, personally, it comes into a bit of a lucky dip. Um, but no doubt there is always a reason that some people are catching those bigger fish. They're doing that little thing different uh, and they figure out what those bigger fish want to eat and that's what you have to do in each sort of scenario you go to in each arena you fish. So I'm not one to really figure that out. I like to churn through them and make sure I'm in with the best chance of catching good numbers of decent quality fish rather than that really big one. Um, but every now and again you do come across it and you do find an area that keeps throwing up, throwing up those bigger fish. So time of the water as always but really paying attention to detail to the um the key points of where you've caught a big fish before uh the next one best leaders for bring fishing near heavy structure um heavy leader essentially so a lot of the time you can't go too heavy crystal clear water uh the fish are fussy that's nasty structure so you want to go heavy but you just can't um sometimes you just have to you just have to go heavy i'll never forget um this was a long time back but bushy and starlo i think we were fishing a mega bucks at foster um foster's bottom end of the system oyster axle washboard crystal clear the clearest water on the planet uh and those fish are super fussy but i remember bushy telling a story where they came back in the, in the death of the tournament had 14 or 18 pound liters on from when they were fishing up in the dirty water in the racks came through and caught a couple of fish in that crystal clear water on the washboards where you would never think to throw that heavy line. And because he was using that, he could get those big fish out that most of us lose. Um, moved forward a couple of years, I was fishing a mega bucks, bucks with Dizzy Borg. Um, same thing, came down the washboard, still had 14 pound tied on, watched a pack of fish swim off the washboard, threw it to one, one turn around, ate the lure, just a soft plastic, didn't care whatsoever about that leader and pulled it in, it was like a 40 fork over about 1.2 kilos. So, truth of the matter is you probably can fish heavier than a lot of us think. Um, a lot of it's probably mind games too. I've seen enough scenarios now with crazy heavy leader that brim just don't seem to care. If they want that lure, they will take that lure. Um, but there is definitely other circumstances where they are fussy and they will take the time to look at it. You really have to, the same as any situation with fishing, you need to take every situation on its merits. So if you've got super calm, super clear water, and those fish have ages to look at it, fair chance that they're not gonna eat a heavy leader. So you just have to downsize until you find that sweet spot. Um, hard running water, dirty water, um, shaded water, fair chance you can go a lot heavier. And those fish, especially in the current if they're reactive, they don't have time to check what it's tied to, so they just have a crack, and you've got a lot better chance. Uh, as for the I'm probably fussier than a lot of other people. The vast majority of line or leaders that people use, I don't. I don't. I don't like a lot of them. Um, I find them either too wiry. I find them too soft. Um, there's a fine balance between letting your lure work properly, having a good supple leader, but also a tough leader that can handle that rasping on the uh, on the structure. My favorite at the moment, of course, Dial J Thread. Um, I found it's a really nice balance. It's still fairly soft, really good, really tough. Um, maybe a touch thicker than some others, but to be honest, when you're fishing that heavy structure and you're hitting things, it doesn't matter how good it is, diameter is your friend. So the thicker that is, generally the thicker it takes to cut through and the more chance you have of letting it rasp on something before it breaks. Um, aside from that, I did like uh, Gamma Leader was one of the ones I used quite often. It tended to be the same, a little bit thicker for the um, breaking train than most others, but it didn't seem to affect the fish too much. So I fished a six pound as a six pound, even though it was probably in the diameter closer to an eight. 
uh, it just didn't seem to worry the fish. So whether it's all in your head or whether it actually is a factor, I'm not sure, but uh, just make sure you pick a really good leader. So social fishing, uh, all good, chew through the cheap stuff, don't stress too much. When it comes to a tournament and those fish are crucial, then use the best stuff you can get. Um, as I said, it's all confidence. What you like is probably what you're gonna be confident in, but there is some leaders out there, if you pick through them, uh, generally like a rock, a Japanese rockfish sort of leader is the one, because it's built to take that um, abrasion, built to take that rasping, so just just work through them and have a bit of a play and you will find a, a good, strong leader that you like, but by all means, try the J-thread. It's been really, really good for me. Um, and hopefully we can keep improving on that line as well. Moons of brim and where to target them at certain times of the year. So this will vary depending on what area of the coast you're in, what part of the country you're in and certain systems. But um, I'll speak for the mid-north coast because that's where I live. Um, we've just had autumn, we've just had Easter. The first lot of westerlies blew through, which normally happens on Anzac Day. Um, that's a fair sign that the brim that are up the river are going to start migrating to the bottom end to do their thing through the winter and spawn and so on. Um, generally speaking, summertime, the brim move up the system. This is speaking for yellowfin. Um, they go up chasing the prawns, they go up chasing the cicadas. That's where the bait is, that's where the food is. So they will spread right through the system and quite often you will find a bulk at the top of the systems, at the top of the creeks, and they'll feed into all those little tributaries as well. Uh, you'll still catch them on the wall, you'll still catch them right at the bottom of the system, but they'll be residential fish, not traveling fish, and then you can catch them from there to the other end. Once that cool weather hits and those westerlies start pushing the mullet and the brim downstream, the bulk of those fish will pack together, start moving down the estuaries, or moving out of the lakes to the mouth to do their thing at the mouth and on the inshore reefs. Um, that's when you really find big concentrations of traveling fish. Um, where to target them, so summertime, as I said, tributaries, snags, gravel beds, anywhere that there is food for that time of year. So let's take where I grew up, the Manning River, through summer, there's a lot of gravel beds at the top of the system that have tiny little black mussels. The brim cover those things flat out and you'll, you can drive across, across the Martin Bridge in Tari and the whole thing will shimmer at some stages when those mussels come on. Um, you'll find them on the muddy banks up further, chasing prawns, even deeper water chasing prawns, and you'll find them up in the mangroves chasing the little black crabs and cicadas. So that's, that's the warm water, I'll say warm water pattern, not so much summertime. Um, move in autumn, they're traveling, so they're doing a bit of everything. You can still catch them on top water, but you can head down the front to the ones that head to the mouth early. Um, good time of year to be doing it because they're on such a variety of food that you can catch them on a variety of lures and it, and it could be a great time to catch them. Um, head into winter, go to the bottom. If you want to catch big numbers of really good quality fish, that's where they are. The bottom couple of k's of the system, where they're schooled up, where they're doing their thing, where they're making millions of little tiny room, they're hungry down there as well. So. Not saying you won't catch them at the top of the river, um, but the main congregation is going to be down the bottom. So a little twist to that, if you've had a season that's super dry and that water hasn't pushed down or you haven't had a fresh push down, a lot of those brim will stay at the top and they won't come back down the bottom. Um, the salinity is high the whole way through the system. The food's the whole way through the system still. So you won't get the masses run to the front like you do on a wet season where you've had fresh water pushing everything further down the system. So. South Coast, that spawning time seems to be maybe late March, early April on. Uh, and the further you move up the coast towards, say, the Gold Coast, uh, it always seems to be more June, July that that starts to happen and run later. So just as that water uh, that water and the temperature cools as you go up the coast, the trigger for the brim seems to do the same thing. So just something to keep in mind. But there's definitely, that that's the basics of it. There's no hard and fast rules with it. You will catch a brim the whole way through the system at any time of year if the conditions are right. Which leads me to the next question, is there any tips on winter brim fishing? So uh, heading into winter, winter, there was quite a lot of questions on both Facebook and Instagram on winter fishing. To be truthful, it's far from my favorite. Um, it involves a lot more deeper water, a lot more super fast current uh, and schooled up fish, which is not, it's probably not my favorite thing to do. It can be absolutely a ball if they're thick and you're catching plenty of them. Uh, 
but it's also a little, to me, a little monotonous. Um, but the biggest key, whether you're at the bottom or the top for wintertime fishing, same as any cold water fishing, is to just slow down. Leave that bait in the zone for as long as you can. Um, generally, the cooler water, they're a bit more lethargic. They're not quite as active. And, and the stuff that they're eating isn't quite as active as it would be in summertime where they're chasing prawns and having to really chase stuff down. Uh, as I said, no hard and fast rules. That's just the, the general the general consensus to mo most people is to slow down and give them the time to eat the bait. Um, just try and find the schools of fish, I guess, through winter time as a tip. Um, there'll be areas that'll have fish and then there'll be areas that'll have a lot of fish. So go down to a rock wall. There might be a current break in the rock wall, a little, um, a couple of rocks that jut out. They'll sit in that eddy. Um, don't be scared to look through the middle of the river. It only takes a little gravel bed, a little lump or something for them to either spawn on or, um, or to be a current break and then to sit on and rest in between. Um, other things to think of, I guess, generally the smellier baits seem to work and scent seems to work through wintertime. Um, not sure why, things like the gulps definitely, for some reason, tend to work better in wintertime. Uh, you'll catch them on everything, but a lot of scent definitely helps. So probably another one for the winter brim fishing is, um, it seems to be the lighter line definitely helps. As you're at the bottom end of the system, there seems to be a lot clearer water the majority of the time. Um, don't be scared to go right into that clear water, but do try and downsize your leader to three or four pound if they're being a bit fussy. Check, have your leaders, try it. Um, nine times out of 10, they're probably gonna eat it too, but if you get into a situation where they're being really fussy, just drop that leader size down a little bit and see how you go. Quite often they'll, um, in that clear water, the light will shine on it and, and the reflection will come through that leader, even though it's fluorocarbon. So the next one, tips to accurate casting. Time on the water, 100%. The only way to get better at your casting is time on the water. Um, seen on social media at the moment, we've got the casting challenge. Awesome, great to practice with, get the movements autonomous, get to know it. Uh, but it's a different thing going out there and trying to put it in the pocket in a mangrove or hit a pole or just putting it in the pocket you need to, skipping under a dock. The only way to do that is practice. And the only way to practice that is actual time on the water because there's so many variables to it. And there's wind, there's current, there's different waves, which will make a lure skip a different way. Um, that, that's the only way to do it. So growing up on the Manning River, there was a lot of mangrove fishing that we did. Uh, the Lansdowne River, overhanging mangroves, small gaps, but you had to hit the bank to catch a fish, essentially. You could catch them, but if you wanted a good one, you had to hit the bank. So I grew up, when I started casting lures for brim, it had to be in that spot. So I had to try and get it in that spot. And I got hung up time after time after time, but the only way to catch those fish was to get it in there. So. Uh, I'm probably not quite as good as I was when I was, say, 20, 22, uh, when I did a lot more of it. I don't fish that way quite as often anymore, uh, and I fish for a lot of other stuff. Back then it was brim, 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 uh, and yeah, just time on the water, got, got those casts in there. Once you've got it, generally you don't lose it too much. Uh, it's just, as I said, it becomes autonomous. You know the feel, you know the... Um, you know the distances and you get your eye in really well. The other big thing, and it's also something that I probably don't stick to as much anymore because I like certain gear for certain te techniques now, uh, is to try and use the same rod. If you like doing a certain thing, just have that rod in your hand all the time because that's the one you get the feel with and that's the one you'll be able to put it in there with. So personally, I like to throw a different rod for say a plastic as I do a crankbait, as I do a top water, um, as I do a vibe or whatever it may be, even variations in those lures, I'll chop and change rods to the um, to the action that I find suits the lure the best. Downside to that, you're picking up a different rod all the time, uh, and you might spend half an hour with one rod, get your eye in, cast, you can put it wherever you need to, uh, pick up something different, and it's 20 feet in a tree. So the downside to that, accuracy goes down, upside, you're using the right lure for the, the right rod for the lure once you do get it in the right spot. What retrieve do you find works best for hard bodies? So let's go yellowfin first. Um, super technical when it comes to yellowfin brim fishing with hard bodies, especially on open flats. You chuck it out, then you want it. 
and then you chuck it out and you wind it back in again. It is the most simple form of fishing for brim there is. There's generally no need to put twitches, pauses, whatever it may be in that retrieve. Um, as I said with the yellowfin versus the blacks, they're super inquisitive. They will look and tap and follow and chase flat out until they eat it. Uh, and quite often it just takes a repetitive cast. So I'm not saying you can't put a twitch and a pause and a little variation in there, but essentially, and what I still find the most effective retrieve is to cast it out and wind it back in. So when it comes to black brim, quite often you need to do a lot more to encourage that bite. So they will eat it, just winding it in. The same as the yellowfin. Uh, but quite often they want that pause, they want that change in retrieve to trigger the strike. So if it's just wobbling along, same as always, they will literally follow it to the boat sometimes and not commit. Uh, but if you have a pause and then a twitch after that pause, quite often it will trigger that strike and they'll crunch it. So the other side of that, without having to put the work into it, is to make sure you've got a lure that is hitting the structure. So essentially what you're doing then, it can be a straight retrieve, but you're bouncing into everything. So whether it be a log, a rock on the bottom, the sand digging up, uh, something to change what that lure is doing is another thing. That's just a trigger. That's just not the same old hard body chugging along, doing nothing. It's, it's looking like a real piece of bait, real bait, real shrimp, real little bait fish. Um, the other side of that, when you're digging into the bottom, when you're bouncing off structure is the noise too, the ticks, the cracks, the the noise of that bib and the trebles and the hard body knocking off rocks and timber is also something that triggers those fish into striking. So quite often if you're just winding it in and you'll get a lot of follows right to the boat, just mix it up. It's only, literally the only way to figure out what's going on is to mix the retrieve up until you find the one that works. So I know, um, as I said, the basics, chuck it out, wind it in, follows, it'll, it'll work. Um, but sometimes you just need that something else. So mix it up, there's no set rules. Do what you need to do to get that bite. Um, there's a couple other tricks to throw on cranks too. So say you want to slow roll it over some shallow country, um, but it's quite snaggy. High rod tip to keep that swim angle right, but also let you float it back up over the structure when it's bouncing into it. Um, that way, high rod tip will keep it a bit shallower. When you get in those deeper holes, point it back down, crank it down into it, up and down all the time. You can just, you can manipulate that hard body to essentially do what you want, providing it's a little bit buoyant and can float up over that, um, over that structure. So, as I said, no hard and fast rules, just mix it up and do what you can. Favorite place to fish for brim, either fishing for winds or the memories. <sighs> I don't have favourites. I genuinely don't have a favourite for anything at all. But um, Foster's probably the one I... That, Foster and Sydney Harbour would be the two places that I enjoy the most uh, to fish. Between, it'd be a toss-up between Sydney Harbour and Hawkesbury. Um, Sydney and Harbour, Sydney Harbour and Hawkesbury and Foster, sheerly for the potential size of the fish in the structure that they're going to be in. So Foster, well known for big fish, big rack dwellers, angry fish, and gnarly structure. It's it's pretty much where I started brim fishing, uh, the Manning and Foster. And there was always Foster because the, there was big cranky fish in really, really nasty structure. And that is the most fun you can have brim fishing as far as I'm concerned. Trying to muscle those things out on heavy tackle in some of the sharpest oyster encrusted poles and racks is just unless you've done it you don't quite get how exciting it can be um sydney harbour and the hawkesbury very similar reasons um so many really good quality fish in those arenas uh it's such a massive variety of structure to fish so the hawkesbury's so long you could be fishing deep rock walls at the top to weedy flats and big rock washes at the bottom um, and anything in between. There's pretty much every type of structure you can think of in that system. So for that reason, that's probably, at, I'd say the Hawkesbury and Sydney Harbour would be at the top of the list, um, purely for the fact that I could fish so many things there and never get bored of it. It would never be, it's always something different. So, um, but Foster probably for the memories because I've hooked so many fish and lost so many big fish out there. 
Uh, it's always the fact that you want to go back and you want to have another crack at them because literally every next cast could be a clunker and you have to work so hard to get that thing out. When you do, there's no reward like it in room fishing. So they're, um, they're definitely up there for the wins. Oh, the Hawkesbury again, one of my only grand final there in the Brim, like in the Brim series. Um, had some great bags come out of that place. It's it's a love-hate relationship with it as well. I've had some absolute shockers there, but I've had some cracking bags come out of it, and I never quite feel I've had a perfect day on the Hawkesbury. There's always something that goes wrong. Uh, always lose a key fish, make a bad call, uh, and the day that it all does come together, look out because there's just so much potential for so many big bags coming out of that place. Uh, one day I'll get there. Uh, tips for finding deep water brim. Another one I had a lot of questions on this one actually. A lot of people want to go fishing with deep water brim. If you are going to fish deep, get some good electronics. 100%. The biggest key for me uh, as someone that's not great at fishing deep water for brim, good electronics saves me so much time and finds me so many little keys uh, that other people, well they do now, there's a lot of good electronics out there now, but, and then knowing to use that, a good fish finder is essential. Um, the new hummingbird stuff that I've got on the boat, the Helixes, especially with the 360, you just know what's down there, you know where the fish are, and you know where the fish are going. So being able to tell what bottom type you're on between mud, rock, mussels, cockles, um, I don't know how deep people call deep, if it's over 10 foot it's deep to me. So being able to see in a place that I don't fish often or don't um, don't know too well, being able to search that area with good electronics is invaluable. It will take so much longer to do it without it. Um, the other side, of the, there's probably two other keys to fishing deep that I've found. Um, one of them's moving around until you find the fish and then staying on them once you do find them because they tend to school up in packs. Uh, I've always found if I catch one fish in the deep, there's a fair chance I'm going to catch more. So I tend to sit on the spot uh, and we'll wait for that pack to come through then actually go looking for it because you can move around as much as you want and you can be one step behind those fish the whole time. Um, so being patient when you're in the deeper water, they, if you're in the right area, they will come on eventually, be it a moon phase change, a tide change phase, some wind. Uh, or some other factor that you don't even know about, they will come through if it's a spot that you know produces fish or that you found the fish on. Uh, the other one I've found is the one circumstance where you probably should fish fairly light line too. For some reason, I always get more bites in deep water on light line. Could be in my head, could make no difference, but definitely, um, definitely seems to be the case. Uh, if you're in current, it's possibly the hardest, the hardest deep water fishing. So the first part of that question, I was more thinking to, um, to lakes, jump somewhere like the Clarence River, Browns Rocks, 10 to 60 feet potentially, heaps of current and nasty bottom. Uh, getting a feel for that lure, knowing the sink rate, knowing where it is each cast in that current so you don't get snagged on the bottom but can still present close enough to the bottom for the fish, uh, there's a real art too. So the guys that do it a lot, don't even have to think about it. Same as I do for a lot of the fishing I do. You don't even have to think because you do it that often. Um, but because I don't fish deep too often, I do have to think about it. So generally speaking, I'll head the boat into the current, hold into the current and slow my drift down. Uh, I'll cast up current to give the bait time to sink and it'll be drifting faster than I'm moving the boat so it'll come past. So theoretically, I want the bait to be hitting the bottom pretty close to under or parallel to the boat uh, and then let the electric go and try and drift with it, keep that contact. Um, harder than it sounds quite often, but that is the key, keeping contact in it uh, and knowing where your bait is and keeping a feel for it. So once you can do that, you can really manipulate where your bait is on the, on the drift and on the bottom uh, and you need to keep it in that strike zone. If it's not within a couple of feet of the bottom when the fish are on the bottom, then you're pretty much not going to get a bite. So uh, that's that's probably the key to that. If you're getting snagged up a lot, quite often it pays to go heavier than lighter. Uh, a lot of guys think I'm getting snagged too much. I'll go lighter, so it's not getting to the bottom as quick. But that quite often quite often makes it 
too hard to keep in contact with the lure. So essentially you may as well just go heavier. They can't see what's written on the jig head or what weight you've got on there. If it's in the strike zone, it's food to them. So say you were fishing an eighth in 20 feet and you were getting snagged heaps, you couldn't quite feel it. Go to a quarter ounce, thump it down there so you know where it is. Aside from that, throw a blade that's nice and heavy and gets there quick, a soft vibe, just something that gets down to those fish quicker and you can um, you can keep contact with and know where it is the whole time. Not only does it help you feel the bottom, it helps you feel the bites at the same time. So that goes for any, any sort of deep water structure. You want to know where your bait is, especially in current. Can you walk us through your process of sight fishing? So the single most important thing sight fishing is putting these things on. So having a really, the best set of pole rise sunnies you can afford is probably the biggest key factor. The second one is once you get those, getting the right lenses in it for the situation. So I use Costas, um, I've used a couple of different brands, been associated with a couple of other brands throughout my career as well, um, but Costas have probably been the pick of them for me. I uh, had no association with them at all at the start, went through a whole heap of brands, a whole heap of frames, um, and these just came out on top of what fit my head the best, to be honest, to, to start with. Um, get a pair of Polaroids that fit properly. So you don't want light getting in the side. So you turn side on there, you got a big gap, no good. Um, what that does, lets light in and effectively doesn't let the sunnies polarize properly. Um, without these, you can't see through that water right, well, properly. Um, second thing is having the right lens. So the two lenses I personally like is green mirror for high sun, 75, 80% of what fishing I do. Uh, the other one's a silver sunrise. So it's a yellow lens with a slight silver mirror. That's the early morning, late afternoon polarizing lens that um, just gives you that little bit more con contrast in the low light. So yeah, Polaroids, number one. That's the, that's the biggest key to uh, side fishing. Uh, a trained eye is probably the next one. So knowing what you're looking for. Practice makes perfect, as always. Um, time on the water, knowing what you're looking for. So a lot of people go out looking to see a fish and you can't see them. They're built to not be seen by birds, uh, other predators. So they're gonna make it as hard as they can for you to see them. The things you've got to pick up on is a bit of disturbance or a shadow or something different. So uh, quite often trout guys that know it the best, they, they do it perfectly, but a lot of brim guys are, um, are really good at it as well. You're looking for a shadow. So the same as on your side imaging on your sounder. Beam goes along, hits it, throws a shadow, easier to see. Sun comes down, hits the fish, throws a shadow, heaps easier to see. So the shadows are darker than the fish. You've got a silver brim or a, or a silver yellow whiting on a sand flat. It is nearly impossible to see that fish in some circumstances. But if the light's on the right angle, you will see that shadow. Um, and quite often you're even looking for a whole fish. There can be a tail hanging out from behind a pole, knowing what tail that fish belongs to, whether it's got the little black lines on it that a brim has, um, a little set of blue lips out the other side of the pole, just little keys like that uh, are probably the essentials to sight fishing. And the only way to do it is to get in the situation uh, and spook them. Just you, fishing, it's the hardest part. I pre fish nine times out of 10 with my eyes uh, and my sound are a little. Um, but mostly with my eyes just so I can see what's there and the best way to figure out if it's a brim is to drive up and have a good look at it. So if it's shallow water and I can see it there, if you want to practice it, find some clear water, drive over the whole lot of them and spook everything and pick what is what. So quite often I'll have some guys on the boat that'll see a fish take off, think it's a brim or something else. So it's quite often not the fish that you think it is, but if you get in the right situation, you will be able to tell the difference on those with a bit of practice. So the, the biggest telltale for me, especially with the yellowfin, uh, is the they've got a black line on the very outside of the fork of their tail. That's the, there's no mistaking that, there's not many other fish in the salt that have got that. Uh, and you can tell once they take off that that's what it is. You get to a little bit dirtier water, it can be a lot harder. Then you're looking at shapes. You're trying to pick the shape of a brim versus the shape of a ludric versus the shape of a mullet or a whiting. 
uh, and sometimes it's really hard to pick that but as I said with a trained eye with practice you will know whether that's a brim or not um, the other one is throw a lure at it if it chases it you get a better look at it and you'll, and you'll know it's a brim the other thing to do is to try and get high on the boat as well um, the higher you are the better the angle you get to look through the water most of the time not always possible on a low bass boat um, but say you're fishing some flats and there's not a lot of wind and, and the fish are a bit further away and spooky jump up on the engine cow and have a look if you really need to see it so if you really really want to go sight fishing there, there's just little things you can do to put you at a bit more of an advantage than you would be in normal circumstances um, the way to approach it stealth is is one of them uh, if you it's one thing to go looking and practicing and trying to see what the fish are once it comes to the crunch of actually catching those fish you need to be able to see them without spooking them off at the same time so lower angles um, more distance between you and the fish and that's where it does become difficult but approaching those fish in the right direction uh, can also be one of the key things to do so say you've got wind blowing around um, sound tra travels with the wind and <clears throat> sound travels with the water so and generally speaking the fish will have their nose into the current so sneaking up behind them uh, into the current so the noise of you isn't flowing into where the fish are they're less likely to hear you coming same with the wind if you're going into the wind definitely harder to cast by all means um, but you're more likely to be able to sneak up on them because that noise isn't going to blow over them or, or not going to travel to them so they don't know you're there as much the other key thing that I've found sight fishing personally is having the hydrowave on so I've had a hydrowave for quite a long time now um, a lot of people ask does it work don't know seems to had so many things happen with it on that have never happened with it off um, including when I'm sight fishing so I had one circumstance when Daniel Brown and I were fishing Lake Macquarie fished this flat glassed out never not a chance we were ever going to catch a fish there under normal circumstances four feet deep crystal clear and a big pack of fish roaming along it turn the hydrowave on all of a sudden we could get closer to them cast to them and they didn't care we were there they were eating the bait so just little things like that that give you a bit more of an advantage each time it's the one percenters that um that can help you have a really good sight fishing session so yes yeah, stealth um just not letting the fish know you're there and then training your eye to know what you're looking at even if it's not seeing the fish it's seeing the rock that it should be sitting next to or or the little dig in the bottom when it comes to black brim like that that one's a really really hard one to pick so having a clump of gray on the bottom in amongst some brown and then being able to pick a gray brim sitting in the middle of it can be really really hard and when i first went down to malacoota and tried to do it i could see the gray dots everywhere couldn't see a fish in it to save my life to start with or couldn't make out that there was a fish in there but the guys that have been doing it forever know what to look for it's just a change in tone a change in shape something else in there that you need to um that you need to pick up on so that's probably the the bigger tips for the sight fishing um stealth is the stealth and being able to see them with a good set of polaroids are probably the two biggest keys what would be the first thing you would throw and does fluorocarbon help that's going into that same question of the sight fishing um first thing that i'd throw wouldn't even have a clue uh, i guess it'd depend where i was um just a lightweight of plastic of some sort something still something that doesn't land too hard uh, and isn't going to spook that fish um you need to lead cast them so you don't want to drop it right on top of a fish's head if you're sight fishing you want to cast past it drag it to them um that way you're not going to spook it and always try and go in front of them not behind uh, anything that comes behind a fish when you're sight fishing is probably going to be seen as a threat or a surprise to the fish uh, so they're more likely to bolt you want to lead cast them drive in front of them at an angle drag it back to them um, as i said a lot plastic less of a splash a bit more subtle when it hits less likely to spook them off um, that really depends where you are put on the thing that you are the most confident in catching a fish with and that's probably the one that you're going to catch it on uh, does fluorocarbon help 100 percent has happened before when I can't catch them on anything but straight through fluorocarbon. Throwing soft plastics, I don't love to throw straight through fluoro, but when it comes to sight fishing, quite often I find I have to. 
the one time that stands out for that is I was fishing some flats at Malakuta, casting on these mudding fish, raid, pretty long leader, maybe a 15 foot leader, thinking that that was going to be enough to spook them. And it was literally the shadow of the lure and then the braid going over the top of those fish that was spooking them off. So as soon as the braid went over them, it threw a shadow on the on the water, they legged it. Now that tuned into stuff being above them and that spooky that I couldn't even get close to them for doing that. Um, went back to fluorocarbon, straight through fluorocarbon, didn't throw a shadow, cast over everyone I wanted, started catching fish. So does it help? Potentially, yes. Um, Worth a try anyway. Oh, there's no, as I said, there's no rules in fishing. You just need to do what you think is going to work at the time to catch those fish. So don't um, don't be scared to do something out of the ordinary. So there you go. Hopefully that's given you a few little insights into how to catch a brim. Um, I know that's there's there's so much to it. I'm still learning personally, and nearly every time I go out, I find something different, a new bait, a new technique, a new way of approaching things. Um, but again, the same old stuff works as well. So. Even if I can help you catch a couple of extra fish on your next trip out, that's a job well done. And fingers crossed you all aren't going too stir-crazy sitting at home watching me jibber-jabber on. And, yeah, thanks for listening and good job, Diver.